Hey, this is Bryce Johnson from Expedition Bigfoot. You're listening to the Paranomaly Zone. Look, I know the supernatural is something that isn't supposed to happen. It does happen. A ghostly apparition in the dark of night. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, that's hysteria! Hey there, fellow zoners. You are in the Paranomaly Zone, your weekly dose of all things. You guessed it, paranormal, strange, and mysterious. My name is Patrick Koffenberg, and I am joined, as always, by my co-host with the ghosts, the paranormal poster boy himself, the thin-skinned Mike Carbno, both (laughs) literally and figuratively, apparently, because, uh, well, well, figuratively, because Mike is, he's sensitive, but uh, yeah. now, literally, because he's like <laughs> bleeding profusely from his forearm. And I oh. <laughs> okay, I exaggerate a little bit. But, <laughs> yeah, the blood part. But hey, uh, yeah, you had a, a crap ton of scratches on your arm, and I inquired yeah. about that. And well, some of them are from the dogs, of course. But then there are some other ones that I had noticed the other day that I don't know how they got there, and very familiar with uh, old people's skin tears and dealing with them a lot. I thought, oh my God, I got a freaking skin tear. Talk about getting older. Mike literally sits, he's, he's sitting on his couch watching TV <laughs> and his skin just yeah, rips man. open. Just just out of nowhere. <laughs> he's, if he laughs too hard, yeah. his skin just, whoop, oh, there it goes. I'm sitting on the toilet with my pants down under my ankles and my thigh just opens up. Ouch! <laughs> oh man, that is, that's a scene from a horror movie yeah. if I ever thought of one. Yeah, oh that's, that's bad. That's beyond skin tear. Yeah, yeah. It's a little beyond intimate too for our listeners, so we apologize for that visual, but hey. Yeah, it usually happens when like if you have a lot of fluid build up in your leg maybe and it keeps filling and filling and okay. expanding and Got it. sweating out this fluid and Yummy. until it just bursts and it can't handle it anymore. Terrific description. Yes, Lovely. I've seen that and dealt with that many times too. But anyway, yes, go ahead. Shall we go on, <laughs> or do yes. you want to keep talking about grotesque no, I uh, do skin not. ailments? Okay. Well, Mike, it is good to see you. It's been a couple weeks. Yeah. Um, it seems like forever, man. But uh, yeah. Um, yeah, we're back. Uh, we took a week off from the flagship podcast. I say that. Yeah, kind of flippantly, but not not really. It, it is the main podcast. We did get a Patreon exclusive episode out last weekend. Hope you guys go and check that out. I did post a couple uh, vlogs on the old Patreon page, you know, five six minute video clips of yours truly sitting there just blabbing about whatever. Some interesting stuff. Uh, the paranormal blame game, all the crap that's going on in the paranormal TV landscape. Yeah, might take my opinion on that. And then uh, last uh, just a couple days ago, I posted my thoughts and opinions on um, supposed fakery going on in a particular paranormal program uh, as an example <laughs> for this one and kind of paranormal programming fakery in general are you know my, yeah. my take on that because there seemed to be a whole thread going on online there you know attacking you know who you know the guy at the top <laughs> when, when you're on the top people aim for you so that's how it goes but uh, yeah, if you guys are interested in seeing that, we'd love to see it at the Patreon page. All sorts of great stuff available over there. Tons and tons of exclusive episodes, all sorts of exclusive audio and video ghost hunting footage from our own personal ghost hunting investigations, and so on and so forth. It's good. Mike, I got the it is sh- good. I got the shameless Patreon plug out of the way immediately. Yeah, um, you kind of rambled with it a little bit, but it's okay. I, I tend to do that. I you tend gotta, to do you that. got the point across. Well, because I was thinking about, you know, I put it at the end of the show the end of the episode. And I'm like, how do I know people even get to the end of the episode? I was going to say, yeah, nobody's going to hear it then. (laughs) So Uh. we'll just try it out, doing it like right away. But uh, in all sincerity, it is 
good to see you. And you make me nervous when you cough because I'm waiting to see your face split. <laughs> yeah, my face splitter, just a lot of phlegm come out and hit my camera on <laughs> your You're done for the day after that. <laughs> Man, we're just full of grotesque visuals today. Yeah, we yeah, apologize. I'll, we apologize. I got to quit. Okay. Well, Mike, uh, we got some, uh, got a good one lined up today. We do. Startling UFO slash alien encounters, uh, sightings, experiences, you name it. Um, you know, trying to focus on one particular topic in this this area uh, seemed a little fruitless, especially, you know, our schedule doesn't exactly allow us a lot of time to sit there and focus on some things every now and then. So we're like, hey, why not throw together a mishmash of all sorts of crazy, wacky, alleged UFO slash alien encounters. They are weird, by the way. Um, they are weird. I love them. I, um, are they are they 100% truthful? We don't know. Are they fabricated? We don't know. Um, we're going to go through them and uh, talk about them. Right. So, are any of them truthful? We have no idea. Some of them got to be, <laughs> in my opinion. In hey, my opinion. Yeah, the percentages uh, kind of lend us to that um, result, don't they? But... They are bizarre for sure. I'm looking at my professional notes right now, and we're, we're not going to cover a couple of the more well-known ones. And hey, hey we, we've already covered them on uh, the Paranomaly. Oh, zone. absolutely. Um, you know, like the Travis Walton um, abduction, alleged abduction, the Betty and Barney Hill um, encounters, sightings. I mean, we've gone over those before. Uh, we encourage you to go check out those episodes. We did that a hell of a long time ago, but uh, they're fascinating topics if you aren't familiar with them. But if you're listening to this uh, podcast, chances are you know all about it already. But hey. Yeah. Well, and Betty and Barney Hill, I mean, that was like at the forefront of of uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, alien abduction, you know, reporting. You know, it's like kind of started it all. And, sure. You oh, know. Yeah. Well, I want to start, Mike, with a local one. Local okay. as in Minnesota, because I'm, I'm from Minnesota, um, if you couldn't tell. Mike is uh, a Nodak, if you couldn't tell. But I did enjoy the years that I did live in Minnesota. I oh, loved God. it. Absolutely. I miss it often. But this is a pretty, um, I was going to say well-known, but it isn't really well-known. It is fascinating. It definitely falls under the category of fascinating. I love it. It's, um, it's hard to dispute, that's for sure. Right, it is. But we're talking about the Val Johnson UFO encounter now who is val johnson you may ask well he was share a sheriff deputy in marshall county right alongside the north dakota border in warren minnesota and he had quite the night didn't he mike um he did man and there's still proof of that uh it's actually his vehicle is actually in a museum there that's right oh that's that we yeah we really, were we were planning we on making a trip a there trip. oh that'd yes. be great that'd be great are, can can I like piggyback on you, or is your back like not capable of that? Are we going to have to find a, an automobile to get there? No, uh, Mike's staring well, at me blankly. Like, I, are you it's serious? like I even <laughs> thought. Yeah, well, let's see. Let me figure that out. Uh, yeah. I think that's a big no. no. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I don't have my my soundboard up. I need to get that the soundboard up so I can play our. I miss Igor. You know, I miss him giving giving us his. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. Well, no, this no. episode is. Is wrought with uh, some kind of a mechanical uh, oh, don't, something. Don't say it, man. Don't, <laughs> I'm not gonna. Don't say anything. So I went with mechanical instead of yeah. <laughs> what it really was. But well, all I can say is we have a great guest interview lined up next week, and if we encounter the yes. same mechanical issue, then I am going to throw this computer out the window. No, I'm going to throw it through the window. Um, but <laughs> I, I don't know what the hell's going on here. And I just, the podcast will be on hiatus until further yeah. notice. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'll just, yep. I'll just change the, uh, I'll change the logo or the screen on the Twitter page. to just a big fuzzy blank, you know, or yeah, something. Yeah. I don't know. Or please stand by. There you go. That works too. Yeah. Oh, fuzzy. All right. Getting back to Mr. Bell Johnson. Yes. This, this encounter goes back to August 27th, uh, 1979. I was three years old, Mike. You think I even knew about UFOs back then? Probably not. Probably not. Well, but Mike sure did. Oh, God. I, yeah. 
Now, I'm going to uh, read from an article from care11.com. <laughs> care11 is a local news station here in good old Minnesota. The title, Minnesota's Most Notorious UFO Sighting Remains a Mystery Four Decades Later. Now, this article was published in August 2021, so it's a couple years old, but the story it hasn't changed at all. Obviously. <laughs> Obviously. Now, on August 27, 1979, as I mentioned, in Warren, Minnesota, about 20 miles from the North Dakota, North Dakota border, Marshall County Sheriff Deputy Val Johnson was on patrol early in the morning on Highway 5 when he saw a bright light to the south on Highway 220. Now, Val Johnson thought maybe that a, uh, maybe there was an accident that he was about ready to come across. He uh, initially thought it looked like a crash semi or even a downed airplane. It was so uh, noticeable. But as he got closer and closer, uh, Val said he, saw, he said the light instantly jumped through his windshield, hitting him like a, quote, 200-pound pillow, knocking him unconscious. Um, that's kind of hard to dispute right there. Um, I don't know what to say about it. It's like, holy crap. Uh, two, okay, by the way, who the hell ever has a 200-pound pillow? Or who would think of that? <laughs> that's just, well, <laughs> so, uh, it just matched his reference at the time, I, I guess. guess. I guess. Now, Val's reaction was actually recorded and it was preserved in the radio call that was recorded Actual radio call to dispatch when he awoke. The dispatch operator, quote unquote, 407, what is your condition? Deputy Johnson replied, I don't know. Something just hit my car. Dispatch replied, what's your condition? Are you okay? Johnson said, something attacked my car. I heard the glass breaking and the locks. The brakes locked up. I don't know what's going on. Now, according to the Sheriff's Office investigation reports, Johnson, Johnson's wristwatch and the clock on the 1977 Ford Cruiser, Ford Limited Cruiser, stopped working for 14 minutes. Now, that's, I, that seems like an insignificant portion of the story, but that part is always kind of trippy to me. You know, talk about missing time, perhaps, or I don't know what the hell's going on there. That's it's bizarre. Johnson also said his teeth were fractured at the gum line and his eyes were burned. This is a quote from Johnson. He said, my eyes were extremely painful as if I'd been subjected to something like an arc welder burn or something like that. An arc welder burn. Ouch. Now, he said that during a 1980 TV show interview on That's Incredible. Do you remember That's Incredible, Mike? Oh, I, I, I watched it all the time. Ah, man. You can find stuff like that on YouTube, I believe. I, oh, I'm, yeah. You, I'm, yeah. I'm hearing like to. the theme song in my head right now. Yep. There's some classic stuff on there if you're interested. Um, you know, that's actually a good, good source for material, maybe, you know, for podcasts. Oh, sure. Topics. We should check that. We could check that out and uh, some other great shows from back then. Now, director of the Marshall County Historical Society, Sherilyn Meyer, says that they have the stuff that people want to come to see. Now, she is referring to as Mike mentioned, the very significant piece of evidence that is at the Marshall County Historical Society Museum, the actual squad car, damaged, damaged and all. This is the big thing they come to see. Now she quote, goes on a quote here, whatever hit him started with a broken headlight. And up here, she's pointing to the car, there's a weird dent on the top of the hood. Broke the windshield, hit the reflector, and bent both of the antennae. I said antennae. Antenna. <laughs> well, that's, isn't that plural of I guess, antenna? I think so. I think that works. <laughs> uh, correct me if I'm wrong, listeners. Uh, no, don't, please. I'll ruin my day. The sheriff's office back in 1979 brought out experts from Honeywell and Ford Motor Company to examine the damage of the car. I have not seen anything like this before, said Ford crash investigator Meridian French. What a great name. My name is Meridian French. That sounds like a wrestler's <laughs> name. Yeah, well, <laughs> at the very least, a wrestler's name. And that was a quote from uh, the aforementioned That's Incredible interview. He says this is extremely unusual. Now, Dennis Breck, the Marshall County Sheriff at the time, said he took Johnson at his word. I feel that whatever Val told me about the light and the strange incident was true. I don't doubt Val in any way. The sheriff tried other means to get an answer as to what happened to Johnson. 
Investigative documents show he reached out to Alan Hendry, chief investigator with the Center for UFO Studies. The biggest mystery about the Val Johnson case is trying to find one neat explanation for something that could behave the way he described, yet create the kinds of damage that we discovered. Again, from the That's Incredible interview. Mm -hmm. Now, no one in the 42, now 44 years since then, has been able to explain what happened, including Mr. Johnson. Upon reflection, we've come to the conclusion that perhaps the creator has made other things we can't readily see or readily identify, and perhaps this is one of the things we encountered on the road, said Val Johnson to a studio audience during the same That's Incredible interview. Now, that's the gist of, of, the, of, the, of his incident, but I think that falls under the category of startling. Um, this, is a, a, this is a police officer. Yeah, okay. No. He's on he's recorded on audio on dispatch. Obviously flabbergasted, injured, something happened that's unexplainable. <laughs> now what uh, do, does any possibility pop into your mind, Mike, um about what the hell that could have been if it was alien in nature? I mean, this bright light that smashes through his windshield and right. hits him like a 200-pound pillow. Now I jokingly talked yeah. about that before. But to me, that kind of sounds like it's it felt significant in size and weight, but not enough to nothing that would cause a fatality or something. You know right. what I mean? Like a certain amount of pressure or something. Yeah. You know, like a blast of pressure, maybe. Nothing, nothing hard doing it, but it's like maybe it was a, a, a something of pure energy that um, hey. would do that, or. Mm -hmm. uh, we still don't know a lot, I think, for, uh, about ball lightning. Could it possibly have been that? You know, I mean, I'm sure that theory has come out, you know, with people that are just would never even suggest that it could be an alien, you know, possibility. Now, just as an update on what Deputy Johnson was up to today, um, and has said that or people in Warren said that he moved away and stopped doing interviews on this a long time ago. Um, Carol Levin did search online and found the address for a Val Johnson in Wisconsin. And so after searching him out, they actually found the right guy, spoke with him for about 20 minutes, but he did not want to go on the record because of the stress and attention this has caused his family for a long time. Mm -hmm. He did, however, permit Carol Levin to pass on the notion that he hopes these new UFO sightings and government reports might give people a new perspective on his story. So mm. the, that's significant that he doesn't, that he's like, he doesn't want to talk about it anymore. Yeah. I mean, that's unfortunate, but I can only imagine, like they said, the stress um, <clears throat> that he's been put through. This isn't something that is easily dismissed, you know, and um, especially, I guarantee it, tons of people don't believe him. Guarantee yep, tons of people. Yeah, and he's going to get bombarded from... Yeah. Yeah. All directions from that kind of stuff. And what's it? You said it was on Care 11, the that's news? What, yes, that's what the article came from, was Care 11. Yeah, that's, com. A, that's a Fargo news station. Oh, yeah. I said, a I said a local Minnesota one. I actually, it is the Fargo yeah. station, isn't it? Yeah. Fargo, yep. You are correct. You are correct. I apologize. Mike corrects me on Or is that one in Moorhead? I know there's, you know, there's one that's in Moorhead. I can't remember that one. Anyway. Warhead, Minnesota. You wonder if this is, you know, a thought that just popped in my brain, if this was some sort of, um, gosh, not a probe, not like an alien probe. As, get your minds well, out I, of the gutter there. You know what I'm no, thinking about? No, I, I did think of that, though. I had that thought. Okay, so, so explain what your thought was when I, um, and not the Well, like not a probe that's sent down from, not the weird set, sick down from probe a ship idea. or a mothership, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, like a, I think a lot of the things that look like a, a ball of light or well, like Foo Fighters during World War II, you know, that for an example, those could very well have been alien probes checking out technology that we were using in the war, you know, uh, something like that. Cause they, you know, following the bombers and everything all over the place, uh, you know, us and the Germans and, yeah. you know, dealt with that. So it could very easily have been a probe like a, like for of that uh, sort like you know. for surveillance purposes that's what I was trying right. to think of you know, yeah, collecting yeah. collecting uh, information and you know yeah. all, all that stuff yeah it wasn't necessarily an organic uh energy or entity whatever you want to call it by any means but uh, well i but we don't know 
I mean, well, yeah, we don't know <laughs> if it was physical and mechanical. You think it would have caused more substantial damage to Val Johnson? I mean, I can't believe mm. it. It didn't ca- cause more than it did. I mean, my gosh, he fractured his teeth, burned his eyes, yeah. lost consciousness, yeah. lost time. I mean, his, yeah. you know, like the cl- his radio, the clock radio, you know, s- stopped working for 14 minutes. His wristwatch stopped working. Mm hmm. I don't know. It's, no, it's, there's a, a lot, lot of, a lot of that stuff you're not going to do just to fake something and try to make somebody believe yeah. something so outlandish, you know? So, Hey, have you ever seen the movie Starman? I, well, yes, of course oh, I have. I think, well, it's one of my favorite movies of that, you know, like that. Um, but that, you know, when he came, when that alien came down as a pure energy and got into the DNA of, uh, you know, pretty awesome. Is Clint Howard in that movie? I don't think he I is. I think he was. No, it wasn't Clint Howard. It was, uh, oh, what's his name? The main investigator kind of looks like Clint yeah, Howard. Yeah, well, he played uh, um, Toad, I think it was, on... Uh, yeah, um, oh, um, uh, oh, shit. Yeah, a, a movie that's as classic as all time. American Graffiti. There you go. I was going to say that. Yeah. I was, for some reason, I was going to say a Hollywood Nights, but no, that's totally different. But yep. Yes, American yep. Graffiti. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But a, a <laughs> fantastic actor. Yeah. I, I apologize to him for saying that he looked <laughs> oh, yeah, like Clint you know Howard. He's listening, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one thing I was going to interject here about Warren, Minnesota. Yeah. I looked it up on Google Maps to see how far both of us are from this place. Okay. Lay it on me. You, from your home... Well, from Park Rapids is, let's see, two hours and 32 minutes. Oh, that's nothing. Not bad. From my house, it's two hours and 30 minutes. Oh, my gosh. Why, so, why can't we, we not could do actually this? meet there? Let's just meet there. Let's, head, let's meet know. at the museum. Yeah. Oh, it damn. would be, uh, yeah. Hey. That'd Simple be, trip that'd compared be to what we've done and what we have coming. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Velisca house, anybody? Ooh. You know, I was thinking about that yesterday and I was, you know how you and I, when we first made the plans to visit the Sally house and we both admitted that we having moments of like kind of feeling kind of leery about it. Like, Oh gosh, what are we getting yeah. into here? I had one of those moments with the Velisca house the other day where I was like, this, cause this is, whereas the Sally house is a mystery of whether or not a murder occurred there. Yeah. There's no doubt that several yeah. murders occurred in this house. Yep. I have a lot of thoughts about it myself. I, Ooh. it's not going to be as easy, um, as the Sally House as far as the emotions and the knowledge of what's gone on there. Oh yeah, I yep. I, I just, you know, the way I've been with uh, getting all emotional with you know with your dad and uh, Mary's brother and that. I hope I don't go in there and just have a total meltdown. Oh, man. <laughs> you know? Well, if you do, I'll make sure to film it for Patreon. How's that sound? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> got to. Just Mike's a quivering, sobbing mess. Yeah. Drooling and like snot <laughs> coming out of my nose. Like that close-up of that girl's face on uh, the, the Blair Witch and her nose bubbles or something. Oh, man. <laughs> I'll make sure to get some uh, good close-ups for you. So that's yeah. Good. Anyway. Yeah. Some of these... Uh, so, I mean, and there are so many, Mike, it's hard to just narrow, to pick out, to pick and choose, you know, mm-hmm. whatever, however you want to describe them, the most bizarre, the the most odd. Uh, so we did find a very convenient um, article from allthatsinteresting.com, and they had a list of several here, and we're going to cover a couple of them. Now, this next one here, Mike, is the 1969, if you want to pull up the link that I sent you the other day now so you yep. can follow along. Yeah, this is their second. This is the second story they account they share on their their article here. This is the 1969 Berkshire's UFO incident. Um, this is one of those deals where it's 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 the amount of people who share the experience that adds a lot of validity and weight to it. You know, it's not just one person's word against everybody else. I mean, this this involved a lot. This involved numerous people. So again, that kind of adds a little weight to it, in my opinion. Right. No, absolutely. Now, as I mentioned, this occurred back in 1969. It was September 1st, to be exact, 1969, when numerous residents of Berkshire County, Massachusetts, individually reported, numerous residents individually reported having seen a UFO. 
Of course, authorities were at a loss for any possible explanation or any, you know, acceptable explanation, I'm sure. It's like, we can't just say it's a UFO. Good God. This wasn't a lone sighting induced by sleep deprivation that could be easily dismissed or any number of other kind of flippant explanations. It truly appeared as though something uncanny had actually occurred. Now, the evening in question, September 1st, 1969, Numerous residents spotted lights above Sheffield in the southern Berkshires. Many of the witnesses said that the lights were fitted to an unidentified disc-like, no, disc-shaped craft, sorry, that was maneuvering in unprecedented ways. Some witnesses claimed that they lost track of time as they gazed with stunned fascination at the object. One such witness was named Thomas Reed, who was nine years old at the time. Now, in the car with his mother, brother, and grandmother, the family had noticed a group of glowing orbs dash out of the roadside trees. That's kind of terrifying. Now, Reed goes on to claim that something actually astounding happened when heading home, his family approached Sheffield Bridge. This is a quote. It came to a stop off the right side of the road, he recalled, of the glowing orbs. Everything got really calm. It was like being in the middle of a hurricane. There was like a a barometric change in pressure. It was just a dead silence. Then there was an eruption of crickets and frogs, and it got really loud, and that was it. Now, that's kind of interesting. It's, it's, you know, what the the silence followed by... uh, very audible eruption from frogs and crickets. Now, yeah. is that just comparatively it's, speaking because it was so silent that the frogs and crickets sound even louder? Or for whatever reason, are they just humming and buzzing, you know, like never mm. before? Now, what are your thoughts on that, Mike? What the heck's going on yeah. with the crickets and the frogs? Well, I maybe... Uh, <laughs> I'm putting you on God, the spot. I don't know. I always do. I'm sorry, man. It's a tough one. I mean... uh <laughs> I I have no answer. I have no speculation. No, you, it's really. <laughs> I want to hear tough. your speculation. Uh, well, the first thing that popped in my brain is maybe again. Yes, we're kind of going down to, you know, going down the ladder of the of the animal animal species down all the way down to insects and stuff. <laughs> you know, maybe as we've speculated and talked about, animals are more susceptible and more um, sensitive to such things. And maybe they were experiencing reacting to this in that way that they were just literally buzzing full of life and energy now that they were have been zapped by whatever, you know, was kind of encompassing that area. They were just like in, engulfed with this odd, uh, unexplainable experience. That's the first thing that popped in my brain. Yeah. Well, did that make any you know, sense at all? There, it it does make sense. Um, well, to you and you in, and in you the and I, world, it, it does, and I, I appreciate that. But anyway, <laughs> thank no, you. No, it does make sense. But it, uh, okay, you think of a certain area in a forest or whatever where, you know, daytime, nighttime, there's going to be some kind of a sound of insects or whatever, mm-hmm. and and you know, like when people are out looking for Bigfoot or if they're, you know, whatever, it's like dead silence. You know, it's like whatever's there has stopped them from yeah. reacting. It's like, you yep. know, they're getting to like a defensive mode or something. It's something so terrible is there or that they're sensing something so bad, so terrible, you know, and then when that, uh, that's a good point. And then when that danger passes, it's like, well, yeah, then back to regular bug life, you know? Yeah. Even more so, you know, because yeah, you know, and or bug and possibly life. be, yeah. Or could it possibly be that. All of a sudden, there's like a like a thick uh, <clears throat> paranormal bubble of energy that just starts. You know, it's like something. It's 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 like a portal opening, but it's not opening a portal. It's just it's changing that entire spot mm. into a like a. <laughs> It's almost like igniting. That's kind of like igniting, like some sort of. Uh, it, it's like it turns into like you're 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 in water because it's everything gets thick and and the sound stops. You don't hear anything. Oh, anymore I gotcha. You can't you know because you're ah you're I some like kind that. of a paranormal little little uh, glitch that you're gotcha all of a sudden stepping into, and yeah. then that clears or it 
goes on or or uh, closes up or you know what that you're... reminds me of or what popped in my brain when you said that is the classic movie the abyss when i don't oh, know sure if, yeah I, I don't, have you seen that awesome movie i love it well like towards the beginning of the movie when the when the submarine you know was quickly being approached by this unexplainable giant mass of something and, yeah. and it it can't escape it and it flies right through it and everything just goes haywire and nuts and stuff, and everything shuts down when they're in this whatever the hell it is, this energy, yeah. this plasma. I don't know what it is. And when it finally, you know, comes out of it, it's too late, and it crashes into the you know the you know the the, the cliff there under underwater yeah. in the ocean. That's kind of yeah. what thought to my what popped in my brain there. Like sure. they're, they're kind of being engulfed in this energy. Yeah, know, in a well, physical and that's, way. That's kind of my point as well. I mean, you're you you enter into this and. It's like uh, reality and uh, everything has just changed. It's yeah. tilted. Now, you know, the interesting like tales from the dark side. The interesting, <laughs> uh, well, not, not all of it's interesting, but the uh, the uber interesting part about that is immediately following this, Mike, the family suddenly found itself back in their car, but they had inexplicably lost two hours of memory. Mm-hmm. All of them couldn't yeah. remember two hours back. Now, stranger still, Reed's mother and grandmother had somehow switched car seats during this uh, encounter. Well, uh, Betty and Barney Hill, uh, was it um, uh, was it Barney or Betty? One of them, they had like their underwear. When they got home, they found out that their underwear was on backwards. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. It's like, oh, they can, they can tear you apart and uh, probe the hell out of you and get you <laughs> naked, but they don't know how to dress you. <laughs> Well, back up again. Yeah, they. Well, that's the least important part. I was like, well, we got our yeah. job done. Now go along your ways, there, boys and girls. Um, <laughs> now, Reed has said that over time, even though despite any tangible evidence of their encounter, he's remained steadfast in his in his account. And he said over time, the family has regained some memory of the incident, which includes having been in a hangar like facility with other people. Mm. He goes on to say, "We encountered something. It was definitely not of this world." This hangar thing we were in was huge. It was larger than a football field. The hallway we had seen was circular with a Y configuration almost to control the flow of traffic. This one room had a bowed-in wall that was rounded. Now, it's also important to remember here that Reed was only one of dozens of people. Remember, as we said at the very beginning of this one, dozens and dozens of people who reported witnessing a UFO in the Sheffield area that night. Some adults mm-hmm. even called into the local radio station to report their sightings, while other children in school began drawing UFOs. So, <laughs> I don't think that's, was, that's too much for a for a, a big giant um, hallucination. I think, or a big giant hoax. Sure. I should say. Yeah, yeah. Or maybe it was some guy that uh, with a great sense of humor that was hearing about all these sightings and then thought, "Ooh, I'll give them something." They want to see a UFO? Well, I was in one. <laughs> yeah, I got gotcha. you. But I don't want to throw that doubt on you. Well, you have you to, though. just eat that up. No, I'm not going to eat it all up. But you <laughs> have to. That's what it is. You have to <laughs> no. throw both sides. You ha- you can't sit there and just you believe do. Do. everything. I mean, like going back to Val Johnson, I mean, did he, I'm not saying he just crashed into a deer, you know, no. <laughs> and and. You know, there would have been was, a simple report written on that. There would have been a simple <laughs> report, and there would be evidence of a deer smashed right. through his windshield. You know, the fact that there's yeah. nothing explainable about that is just, it's really hard to wrap your mind around that one. Yeah. Now, moving on to, uh, I'm going to talk about, Mike, here, the Pascagoula alien story that involves two fishermen subjected to experimentation. <laughs> and I hope I'm pronouncing Pascagoula correctly. If I'm not, I apologize. I think you are. It sounds good. Pascagoula. Now, when I was going over this last night, there's a part of it that's really interesting involving like the, upon being interviewed, the, um, was it the sheriff? I, whoever was conducting the interview with the two people who claimed to have gone through this, you know, he was like, I don't believe you. And he got up and left the room, but he left the recorder going while the two gentlemen were still in the room by themselves, hoping, by themselves, hoping to capture them Kind of in collusion, talking about, okay, what are we going to say again? And blah, 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 yada, yada, yada. But no, they, he caught basically the, the exact opposite. Which, again, we'll get to that in a second here. But that adds a little weight to it, I think. 
Now, October 11th, 1973, Calvin Parker and Charles Hickson, were went, they went to fishing, Mike, on the banks of the Pascagoula River in Mississippi. Now, Parker first saw blue lights reflected in the water, and when he did, he thought that police had actually come to instruct the two to leave. He says that a big light came out of the clouds. It was blinding. It was hard to tell with the light so bright, but it looked like it was shaped like a football. I would say, though, just estimating it was about 80 feet long. That's a big football. Yeah. He said he, he also said it made very little sound and it was just a hissing noise. Parker then claimed that three <clears throat> legless creatures, now this is interesting, the descriptions are very, wow, my voice just went through the stratosphere there. The descriptions <laughs> of these are, they're not common. You don't often hear about these legless beings that these two allegedly encountered. He claimed that three legless creatures floated out of the vessel toward him. He went on to describe all three as having mitten-shaped claws. What? <laughs> and they fight. looked like weebles. <laughs> <laughs> no, no legs, just floating. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, anyway, man. go ahead. This is too good. Are those the, were those mittens knitted by Grandma? Um, now, okay, he described all three of them as having mitten-shaped claws, while one was necklace and gray. The while one was necklace and gray, the other appeared to be more feminine. You know, I'm trying not to. I know Mike finds this, all of this. Mike but finds this hilarious. <laughs> But hey, you know, we don't know what they actually look like or what these are. Well, right. Hello. You know, they could they could look like uh, every one of them could look like like uh, uh, Colonel Sanders, and that could be accurate. You never know. Well, God, that would be more frightening than anything. I, yeah. I believe. It smells like chicken. <laughs> I thought you were going to say smells Hot like grease. Smells like it needs to be cabbage. changed. No, no. <laughs> well, Mike, just that's that's why eyewitness reports for anything are so unreliable. I mean, absolutely. I mean, how often, just as a dumb example popped in my brain, how often did people encounter mass murderer Ted Bundy and they would not be able to pick him out in a lineup, but they, right. you know, it's like, I don't know, there's something about it. They just can't do it. Eyewitness testimony yeah. just doesn't hold up, no matter how many people are there and, and can you know valid, uh, verify it. So I'm not saying that, you know, seeing something that's, has, doesn't have legs and is wearing mittens <laughs> and doesn't have a neck. I mean, hey. It was, his name is Guido. His name was Guido. <laughs> and uh, I apologize to any, any Guido out there. We're not making oh, no. fun of you. Yeah. Um, well, you know. Yeah. But he, he did say the the lights were very bright, and so it was very, you know, it was hard right. for them to focus. Uh, you know, at first, well, at least. things could be very distorted. Now, uh, one, as I said, one was necklace and gray, and the other appeared to be more feminine. Now, when one of them tried to wrap its hands around Parker's neck, his natural response of fear oddly subsided. Parker said, I think they injected us with something to calm us. I was kind of numb and went along with the program. <laughs> I do that. <laughs> I do that. He just, yep, he just shook his head. He put his hands at his side. He's like, whatever. Yeah. All right. Have at me. <laughs> yeah. oh, just my don't God. leave me too bloody. <laughs> oh, good Lord. Just, just get over quick. Now, Parker alleged that he and Hickson were taken aboard the alien vessel and experimented upon. Afterward, the two terrified fishermen found themselves back on the riverbank as though nothing had happened. They immediately drove to Jackson County Sheriff's Office and told uh, Captain Glenn Ryder and Sheriff Fred Diamond the entire story. Yeah, and their ball their ball sacks were singed when they got oh, back, and they ah. could not understand what happened. Oh my gosh! You know the experimentation. <laughs> now that's the one time I'm going to go too far during this episode. So well, that's, we'll go with that. That's a lie. You know you're going to do it again. No, no. <laughs> I'm I'm getting very fascinated with the story. Keep going now. When I got in there, they had me. Hickson told the police they had me. He says. There were no seats, he's talking about the vessel, no chain, they just moved me around. I couldn't resist them. I just floated. I felt no sensation, no pain. They kept me in that position a little while, then they'd raise me back up. Hickson claimed that a machine resembling a giant eye looked over his entire body. He said he was surrounded by inhuman, five-foot-tall, monopedal beings. 
So mono what? Mono pedal, not bipedal. Okay, got it, got it, got it. So okay. so they went Crazy. from having yeah yeah exactly monopedal. I'm sorry, bipedal, bi <laughs> bipedal, bipedal, whatever. Um, sorry. No, you're right. You're right. Um, <laughs> Captain Ryder didn't believe the two men. Shocking. He even stepped out of the interrogation room, but left a secret recording device running in hopes of obtain, obtaining proof that their stories were pure fabrication. Okay, now wait a minute. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. You said they're they're monopedal. Yeah, I did. But but yet they float with no legs. That's what I was going to say. That yeah, they floated. Okay. They seemed legless. But hey, this is this is inside oh, the vessel. Yeah. Okay. They put on their ship pants. Then. They put on their ship pants. Um, or did you say shit or ship? I don't know. Ship. Okay, and I said shit. <laughs> Saucer uh, pants, I don't know. <laughs> well, hey, again, th that when shit they pants are usually take off instead of put on. That's but true. anyway, go ahead. When they appeared legless, they were outside the vessel. When they appeared sure. to be monopedal, they were in the vessel. Got it. <laughs> Whatever that difference, difference that might make, who knows? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, hey, Mike, I'm... You make fun of me for being so darn skeptical. You're the one who's being snarky about this one. <laughs> I'm being snarky as hell, I guess. But hey, anything can happen. And I'm snarky with an open mind. The idea of though, being examined by a machine that is a giant eyeball, that's pretty, yeah. that's pretty weird, though. Like you've seen the original movie or the uh, uh, War of the Worlds. Like the big eye that comes out of the ship. Oh, man. With the light. Can you imagine that? Scanning over your body. Now, as I said, Captain Ryder didn't believe the men left the interrogation room, but kept the secret recorder going. But what he heard on the recording made him think twice. Now, this is the quote conversation between yes. uh, the two encounterees, <laughs> however you want to describe them. Jesus Christ, God have mercy. I thought I'd been through enough of hell on this earth, and now I've got to go, got to go through something like this, Hickson said to Parker. But they could have, you know, I guess they, well, they could have harmed us, son. They had use. They could have done anything to us. I just want to cry right now, added Parker. What's so damn bad about it is nobody is going to believe us. Hmm. So? now is no, I hope that recording is still somewhere. Oh, God, no, great point. No kidding. Yeah. Now, of course, the, with no physical evidence and just their stories, there is no, uh, the story remains a mystery. Parker remained quiet about the event for decades, but Hickson's death in 2011, after Hickson's death in 2011, Parker wrote a 2008 book on the matter. So, hey, maybe we should need, maybe we dig up that, that hmm. book. I don't know. I think something definitely happened. It's changed your lives forever. And Oh, hell yeah. You know. Um, Mike, do you need to take a time-traveling excursion? Uh, yeah, I, I do, but I'm, yeah. But I didn't want to say anything. Well, I can, I can tell because <laughs> your physicality, your your movements are kind of a physicality. Dead, yeah. a dead I, giveaway. I start to twitch. <laughs> he does. He, hello, Patrick. Patrick, <laughs> Patrick I, I, I got to pee. Yeah. His, well, actually, your one eye starts twitching. You're just like. Yeah. Arr. And the other one starts, uh, you know, like leaking really bad. I don't know. <laughs> well, before you start leaking elsewhere, let's take a travel. <laughs> let's take a time traveling excursion. We got a couple more really bizarre ones. Trust me, they get pretty good here. Oh, I hate saying good because if this is if this is real, it's <laughs> it's awful for these poor people. Yeah. All right, hold on, boys and girls. This will literally be seamless. And we're back. I told you it would be seamless. Uh, we did experience our own version of time loss, but I can promise you right now we were not abducted by aliens. Well, I guess I can only say that for me, Mike, um, I don't know. He does look yeah. a little, he looks a little disheveled now and he's, oh, he's, sit, I, you know. he's sitting quite daintily on his chair. So I don't know. Sitting quite mean. daintily? I don't know. <laughs> does that, does that mean, mean I've. No, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just don't. <laughs> I don't know. The moment I said that, I was like, oh, crap. There we go. Yeah. Well, you know, you talk about abductions and sitting <laughs> daintily after an abduction. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. That's all I was getting at. Well, we are going to move. This one is pretty darn uh, bizarre. It is the alien abductious abduction of Antonio v uh, Villas Boas. I know I'm probably butchering this. this La Villas Boas? Um, I'm going <laughs> to, okay, I'll just say it. The alien abduction of Antonio Villas Boas that ended in extraterrestrial coitus. Yes, you heard me it right. Is. 
coitus. Um, not a word we use that often on the paranomaly zone. Coitus etius, I don't, uh, the Latin terminology for that. I don't think I've ever said that ever um, on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to ever hear you say it again. Yeah, it's kind of, dis- I, I don't know, it just doesn't <laughs> sound right. Um, anyways, going back to 1954, the story goes, two Venezuelan, te- Venezuelan teenagers claimed that they found a UFO in the woods and were only able to escape their lives after fighting off small, hairy aliens. Now, that <laughs> might sound weird and bizarre, but we've actually discussed... I think we discussed it on a Patreon episode about uh, really weird, bizarre, supposed, small, hairy aliens. Yes. That's um, right. I think it was in Brazil. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I could be wrong on that one. Maybe there's something going on there, kind of, you know, geographically speaking. I don't know what's going on it with that. Could be. Little... Well, that does happen. Yeah. Um, Brazilian journalist, Mr. Martins, I'm going to butcher his first name, so I'm not even going to bother. I'm just going to call him Mr. Mr. Martins covered. <laughs> the alleged experience in 1957, and asked his readers to send in their own. That's when he was contacted by farmer Antonio Villas Boas, or Villas Villas Boas. Martin paid, Martins paid for the then 23-year-old's travel expenses, put him up in Rio de Janeiro, where Dr. Olavo Fantes examined him. Boas claimed that he experienced an alien abduction one day after reading Martin's article chronicling the Venezuela incident, which, of course, seems really convenient. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. I had this right after I read your article. Hmm, how can I outdo the article? Hmm. Right. Or add to it. By the way, and I apologize again if I am butchering this man's, this gentleman's name. It's B-O-A-S. Is it boss? Um, I'm sure your niece, Rachel, is probably screaming. <laughs> in her bedroom right now, just like, ah, Patrick. Boas said that he had been working nights in his family's field in order to avoid the hot daytime temps. On October 16th, 1957, he purportedly saw a red star above the fields near Sao Francisco del Sales. Mike, help me with these pronunciations. Yeah, I'm, I'm not seeing it. Francisco de Sales. S-A-L-E-S, or is it Salas? I don't know. Salas. As, Salas. As it approached, Boas claimed that atop the egg-shaped craft was a cupola. What's a cupola? Cupula. Cupula. What's a cupula? It's a, It's like an open area above where you can look down from, I believe. Oh, that's nice. See, that's why Mike is a... <laughs> it's the, very nice. That's why Mike's the best... Co- it's nice. It's a very pleasant thing. Well, that's, that's why Mike's the best co-host there is, because he helps me out when I have a complete brain fart and he knows what it, things are. Should we go up in uh, up into the cupola Let's and go in the have cupola. lunch, maybe? And I, say, I, I called it a cupola, and Mike just casually just Well, you can call it whatever the hell you want. Well, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. When, when in doubt, I'm wrong. Now, the cupola contained a rotating red okay. light. Okay. You were, so, yeah, I was going to say, uh, the, the actual uh, definition of that is a dome-shaped structure. Uh, uh, it's going to go too much further into... No. Oh, well, that's Okay, fine. with the... Yeah, see, that's going into the... Uh, well, you got to read it now. Well, there's, like, different... D- Different kinds of so this cupola was on top of an egg shaped vessel. Yeah, so it would be like a a, a dome shaped thing that you can go up into. Okay. Oh, anyway. okay. Now this cupola contained a rotating red light. Okay, so I'm I'm envisioning like a, a siren, like a cop's you know the light on top of a cop's car, sure. you know, rotating around. Now, as the vessel extended its three legs to the earth. Boas claimed that he tried to flee but was captured by five-foot-tall beings wearing gray overalls and helmets and then taken aboard their ship. Boas alleged that the beings' eyes were blue and small and their communication consisted of animal-like sounds. That's Hmm. interesting. Now, after blood was taken from his chin, Boas was purportedly placed into a room filled with a strange gas which caused him to feel severely ill. Now hold on to your horses here, boys and girls, and get your head and out of back gutter. behind us, back behind the curtain, you hear a, in a very alien voice say, "Excuse me." <laughs> you know, they, 
the gas. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Made them severely ill. Okay. Yeah. Now, like I said, get your head out of the gutter. Soon. Uh, it's out. A naked and attractive female entered the room. Boas claimed the woman was adorned with long blonde hair. Did you, your mic froze up there. Did you hear what I was, how I was describing it? All I just heard was blonde hair, nothing else. Okay, now this naked. I heard the blue eye, the tiny blue eyes, and then. This attractive naked female entered the room, Mike. Boas claimed that the woman was adorned with long blonde hair and red <sighs> pubic hair, and that the too soon engaged in sex. Afterwards, the woman gestured to her stomach, then motioned upwards, which Boas later interpreted to mean that she would raise their child in space. Boas claimed he felt very angry at having been treated like a, quote, good stallion by the beings. <laughs> and actually what she really meant was patting her stomach and pointing up, she said, that was really nasty. I'm going to throw up now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's why we leave you species alone. My yeah. God. <laughs> now, he was subsequently taken off the ship and watched it ascend toward the heavens. Four hours had supposedly passed since his abduction. Now, although both Martins and Dr. Fontes believed the story was fabricated, the doctor noticed signs that Boas had radiation sickness, such as nausea and bruising, burning sensations in the eye and skin that was painful to the touch. Mike, now get, I, I know where you're going with that one. I think about all <laughs> after this my, mysterious encounter with, uh, with my a, mind is uh, blank member of the fairer sex. <clears throat> and all of a sudden he comes out with burning, searing sensations. Uh, yeah. Anyways, pink skin, <laughs> searing, burning. Well, you know, that would go along with, uh, radiation burns and yeah. I mean, we're, you know, we're joking. He's got this physical, but, of course. And I'm trying to, divert into uh, I know Mike's trying to <laughs> seriousness you know, curl it back towards you yeah. know the serious yeah. tone here but okay and also happen very often for me so in all sincerity this isn't that uncommon of a uh, of a tale when it exactly. comes to I've read other books that have um sexual encounters you know that are different but um I think from what I've read in other stories or supposed to be true stories uh that there is an alien female that uh, and they went into a lot of detail about what she looked like, you know, like this story that you were reading. But um, uh, it was more of a doing it as an experience thing, mm, okay. you know, like it. It wasn't like a um, like oh, let's have fun. Let's you know, it's just like if you want to experience this, we gotcha. will do that, you know, kind of thing. But the guy was like. You know, there's just no way he could, he, he had the choice. He, he, he said no. <laughs> so, and this was while he was abducted and on a huge ship. And he actually had seen that said that he had seen very prominent people that everybody, everyone in this country would know they're that prominent that were on that ship as well. Like, like he was. Damn. So any, anyway, interesting. I think, Mike, uh, back in the Ultra Raw podcast days, I think we may have shared some audio, and again, you can find us on YouTube, of a man under hypnosis um, recounting his alleged abduction, and he gets very emotional. He starts sounding like he's terrified, and he's crying and stuff, and he's describing basically having a sexual encounter yeah. you know, that he doesn't want anything to do with, but it's it's happening. And I remember that, and it was like pure terror i mean absolutely yeah it was yeah now to me gosh how do you dismiss i mean is that just an unfortunate night terrors i mean night terrors are a very real thing that people suffer you know but man absolutely life, that's that's pretty significant you know to yeah. have him affect it like that now boas died in 1991 unfortunately after a successful career as a lawyer believe it or not so there you go. And he, uh, when he, when he passed away, they found that he had some during the autopsy. He had some kind of a very foreign type of uh, of a gonorrhea that they can't, they cannot uh, <laughs> identify as being earthly. So there's that too. <laughs> That's too documented. Hey, Mike, you could be onto something. You know, I mean, my golly gee. Yeah. 
Listen to me. I just said, my golly gee. You know, our kids <laughs> actually, one of our kids actually pointed out to me how I was cursing in a very nerdy way the other day where I wasn't even swearing and <laughs> because I, I said something <laughs> like that. I was like, golly gee, Willikers or whatever the hell I was saying. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll try harder next time. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Got to work on that one. Um, I'm kind of running out of time here, Mike. Let's end it with um, the UFO abduction of pilot Friedrich Valentik. Valentik? Valentik. While he was actually in mid-flight. Now, as I go along uh, with this yeah. story, you might recognize it as we're going on. Um, again, this is something where there's audio of this you know, mm-hmm. out there. You can find it. I want to say it used to be on YouTube. I don't know if it is still. But it's uh, creepy yeah. and it's eerie when you listen to it. Yeah, I remember this story uh, from a, a ways back, and it is pretty terrifying. And of course, every time I see the name terrifying. Frederick, I want to pronounce it Frodrick, <laughs> just like young Frankenstein. Ah. Are you sure it's not pronounced Frodrick Frankenstein? No, Frodrick Frankenstein. Anyways. Now, this occurred, allegedly occurred, well, it did for, to some extent for sure, on, uh, it occurred on October 21st, 1978. With Australian pilot Friedrich Valentik. Valentik, I don't know. We're going to go with Valentik. How's that sound? A, a good Australian name. Yeah. Friedrich I'm Valentik. Sure. Now, Friedrich, unfortunately, literally disappeared into thin air while in mid flight. Now, he was a very experienced mm. pilot. It was during Friedrich's 125 nautical mile training flight aboard his Cessna, or Cessna, right? Yeah, Cessna 182 yeah, Cessna, yeah. Over the, the, is it base or bass? Probably base. No bass. Probably bass straight between Tasmania and the Australian mainline that the confounding incident occurred. Now, um, it does say here, it's important to note that the 20-year-old who was an enthusiast of alien stories and in ufology was a very experienced pilot. Fairly, fairly. Fairly, fairly experienced pilot. Now, at 7.06 p.m., while at 4,500 feet after departing, Hmm. Moore Raven? Moore Raven to reach King Island. Valentique reported that an unidentified craft was following him. Melbourne Flight Service insisted that there was no traffic near him, but the pilot was adamant that a large vessel was on his tail. Frederick explained, Friedrich explained, Frederick explained that it had four bright lights and suddenly passed 1,000 feet above him at remarkable speed. For five straight minutes, Valentique described its movements and shiny metallic exterior. Suddenly, Valentique experienced engine trouble. Melbourne Flight Service asked him once again what the aircraft looked like. It's hovering and it's not an aircraft, were his final words. The last sound radio officials heard was a, quote, metallic scraping sound. Authorities presumed he had crashed but a later search of the area yielded nothing. Not even the Australian Department of Transport could find answers. Even as recent as 2014, new claims are still coming to light. A UFO action group in Victoria alleged that an unidentified farmer observed a UFO nearly 90 feet in length hovering above his farm on the morning following Valentique's disappearance. Uh, that's kind of terrifying. More importantly, the farmer purportedly claimed that the pilot's plane was stuck to the UFO leaking oil. While the farmer said he scratched the airplane's registration number on his tractor, he never came forward, claiming that the ridicule, ridicule he'd received from his peers after telling them his tale had discouraged him. Now, that... Uh, how common is that, Mike? So many people are afraid to come forward with their stories out oh, of yeah. ridicule. I mean, how many people are out there right now with their own experiences, their own sightings, their own encounters, yep. and they just, they're terrified to come forth? Terrified, and they will probably never tell their story to anybody and take it to their grave, I'm sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Unfortunately, the Victorian UFO group never managed to identify the man. For the, UFO, for the UFO Action Group's lead investigator, George Simpson, frustration abounds. This is George. He says, it's easy for some to dismiss, but there are corroborating stories confirming there was a UFO near Adelaide at the time. This was an experienced pilot who should have been able to identify another aircraft, but was clearly unable to. 
Now, ultimately, only a few possibilities regarding the disappearance of Friedrich Valentik exist. One is that he crashed and his remains were simply never recovered, that he purposefully disappeared for whatever reason, or, of course, that he was abducted by entities we don't yet understand. Mike, your your thoughts on this... Um, well, it's a real incident, obviously. This guy really did disappear. Friedrich, there's nowhere to be found. He's out of here. Yeah. Did he simply crash? And for whatever reason, the crash site has yet to be found? Well, yeah. Um, so they haven't found the plane Nothing. either? They didn't find anything. Nothing at all. Yeah. It literally disappeared into thin air. Yeah. I. He was abducted. But they heard, <laughs> you know, the, the, the flight group heard a metallic scraping sound right yeah. after his final words. I don't know what that could have been. Who knows what the hell that could have been. Okay, so that farmer saw this large ship with the plane stuck to it or right. leaking yeah. oil. Right. So what, what they may have heard, that metal scraping sound, was the plane making contact with the outside of that ship and then stopping it as it... Yeah, I mean, it's... <laughs> Oh my gosh! Who it's stuck there for the, stuck there with the uh, you know farmer seeing that? Yeah. Hmm. I froze up. I don't know how that all came out. No, it was fine. You froze up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I know the 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 podcast gods are trying their damnness to not make us work today, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> they're like we yeah, we. Patrick was scaring me before we started. I'm. I apologize. Yeah, I was using real curse words. <laughs> no, you weren't. <laughs> yeah, it was good. It was all right. So, he, but he this was, this yeah. story is 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 eerie um anytime and it's sad and it's tragic obviously i mean this guy's obviously yeah. he's disappeared more than likely lost his life well do we know that is he living freely exactly. up in space right now <laughs> on board this vessel um good god it's kind of how many times has this happened you know where you know before uh, other times when uh ships or planes weren't found or yeah they disappear. Oh yeah, or any the same yeah. thing. Yep, underwater vessels, submarines, any sort of thing. Mike's dogs are trying to get him to move now too, and it's like it's like, come on, Dad, yeah, hurry your ass up. Decided that it's playtime. Yeah, not quite yet. We got a few more minutes yet, Mike. Before we wrap this that this up though, if you could, um, for listeners who haven't heard it, because believe it or not, we do get new listeners all the time, and not only has Mike led a very paranormal life, and that's no joke. I mean, my my God, the guy is just Mister Ghost. That's why he's the go the co-host with the ghost. Yeah, that's why he's the paranormal poster boy. You know, we should have a poster, a literal poster made for Patreon I, yep. um, subscribers. I would love to do that. Have image of Mike. <laughs> now we just have to pick, you know, figure out what type of image we could post on there. <laughs> no, don't do that. Yeah, hello everybody. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's something to think. No, definitely don't do that. <laughs> you know, but, uh, and we'll let the listeners just kind of wonder what I was doing. Yeah. Now, Mike, um, for those who haven't heard it, briefly share your sighting of a UFO that you did have uh, many, many years. Well, not that long ago. What? A, over a decade ago, at least, I would say. But it was, it's never, just like all your ghost stories, they've never changed because why would they? Oh. Um, why change something that, how, how, how it actually happened? Absolutely. Now, I, I'm trying, sense to me. I'm trying to stall here until your, your dogs calm down a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I want to get the story out, but the dogs are like, I don't know what the hell's yeah, happening. Yeah, they're are they, chilling out. Are they mud wrestling or something? What the hell's happening in the background? Now Mike's looking at Mary and uh, Shepard are walking out to the kitchen. I, All right. Well, Shepard might have needed something. Who knows? Well, can you talk about your sighting? Yes. Yeah. Anyway, it was uh, when I lived in Park Rapids and uh, in that very haunted house, by the way. Um, but anyway, uh, standing out on the back deck. And it was, it was late. It was dark. Um, from where I was standing, I was facing, let's see, what, what direction does that face? East? I can't remember. But anyway. So which way? Well, um, let, me, let me help you out here. So you're standing yeah. on, this is the house, the, um, is this the It's Debbie house? It's the It's Debbie house. Are you facing the hospital? No, the hospital is on the front of the house. So are you facing um, the opposite direction of the hospital? Yeah, looking towards like where that bait shop is on the block right then you are Yes, well. then you're correct. You're, you're looking east. You are correct. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so I see, and I'm just standing out there just kind of, you know, enjoying being out there. And from 
my left all the way to one end of the horizon. And it's the only way I can describe it. I mean, every time I tell the story, it's, it's not like the only way I can explain it because it was way off. And then all of a sudden I see out of the corner of my eye this movement coming and it was very low and it passed by me, like, you know, east of me and kept going until it got to the other horizon and it was gone. I mean, it's like I could see it that whole distance and it went so fast, but it was three orange bright lights like in a triangle it elongated a triangle like two in the back and then way up it was a the third or the not the other one but it was a very long triangle and I, I don't know if i've even mentioned that before but that's what it was but um and then it was gone and i got extremely excited of course first uh of anything like that i that i'd seen and haven't seen anything like it since but i mean it's that's another one of those things that's in my memory like it happened this morning kind of thing you know and it just and it moved very quickly right like you said i mean extremely i mean it was like but you you got a good look at it oh absolutely well when you're even if it's moving really fast if you're seeing it way on one end of the horizon and going to the next i mean okay yeah yeah. i mean my head followed it even though it was moving fast so you kind of you kind of it kind of like came into your peripheral vision and then you caught it and then followed it basically Yep, exactly. A great way to put it. Caught it in my peripheral vision, looked over, and then saw it coming and go. Damn. So, and no noise, or you couldn't hear anything at least? Oh, God, it was dead silent. Ha, mean, shit. See, that's the were, part that always is, astounds me, too, is just the silence with these things. I mean, would you be able, Mike, to guesstimate at all the distance? Oh, which, geez, at that all? is so hard. It's so it, hard. Because you don't know the size of it. Right. Exactly. But you know, like how they do that though, like if you hold your, your hand up and you see something moving like a bright star, but it looks like it's a, could be a UFO. Mm -hmm. So you go, you put your arm out arm's length and you hold it. Like if you can fit that between your two fingers, like your, I pinch your head thing, you know? (laughs) Sure. Yep. (laughs) So, I mean, with the way this was and how big it was, I, I couldn't do that. Now, I, d- I didn't know this. I have not gone into detail about because or maybe I have. I don't remember. But as much as I remember the event, the way it happened, like I said, like it was yesterday or this morning, I could not have moved my fingers apart far enough. Yeah, Mike's holding this like thumb and index to, finger. to show how far the back uh, lights were to the front. Dang. Wow. So, no, you've never said that before. No, I don't think I did. Um, and like I said, Mike, just so you know, Mike was holding like his, kind of doing like yeah, the- Yeah, like as far as I could. You know, kind of like <laughs> the, the, the toy gun, handguns as a kid, you know, bang, bang, bang and stuff. He's holding his yeah. thumb and index finger as far apart as he yeah. can. And he couldn't, and fit, he I, couldn't, I couldn't fit it in it. there. Dang I it. couldn't do it. And no noise. Nothing. Yeah. And that was weird. Wow. I mean, that was, was weird. I mean, it was very late, you know, very early in the morning kind of thing. Um, after midnight anyway, but, uh, it was so, that's one of the things I was enjoying being out there at that time. Cause it was so quiet. It was so quiet. Yeah. And, and then when I saw that, that, that silence, that quiet, it, it didn't fluctuate at all. It was just, there's no like going by or nothing. It was like, it's like, it wasn't there. God, you know, someone I mean, else had it, to have seen that too. You know, other people had to have seen that. I would think. Oh, yeah. Well, you yeah, check into orange UFOs, orange bright or, or orange uh, gl- uh, glowing UFOs. It's reported all the time. Yeah. No, that is. It's. I mean, <laughs> so, well, and I was lucky enough to to see it. You know what's been reported many times. Unfortunately, so, I haven't seen anything like that. I want to. Well, but... you probably have, but you thought, ah, no, 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 firefly. No. <sighs> No, I'm not that silly, okay? <laughs> it's a flying beetle that somebody painted with phosphorescent paint. Why am I talking That's like that in your mind? Why am I sounding like that in your mind? Right Why now? are you sounding like that right now on air? I sound like you. What you just sounded like is what I sound like? <laughs> All right. Now I got him triggered. No, oh, I'm just boy. You know it. You know I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, man. alive! That's a good spot to end the recording. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. No, but that's, no, that's no, a no. pretty, uh, uh, like you chalk it up to another awesome experience that you have. Like, damn. It was, I, and I get a little flustered sometimes when I'm 
you know, talking about it or to think about it because it's like. It's almost I mean, like it's, I mean, because you can, again, I've said this so many times when you're looking at Mike recount these tales, he's, you, you can see that he's replaying it in his mind. You're looking at it in your mind's eye. <laughs> you do that all the time with your, you know, I when do. you're sharing your, but I'm saying that's great though, because you're, you want to make sure that is yep. the same. I don't want to leave anything out, but, yeah. uh, but I did go into more detail this time about that. I, yeah. I'd never heard I about know. you not being able to fit it in no, like, you know, no, trying that's, to that's true. Though. I, yeah. Damn. You know, and it's like it's so different than when I saw like the ghost of the girl or the shadow people. Mm -hmm. I don't have that kind of well, you know, I don't have that kind of a reaction to that. No, I know, you know I know. Yeah, but yeah. when I saw that, it was like, man, I got so excited. Yeah, I know I, you did. <laughs> yeah. oh. no, anyway, I, I kind of have I have memories of the first time you told about that, and yeah. you're still just like giddy. You're like going, I, I saw. Yeah. I saw one. I saw one. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. you bastard. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, Mike, um, real quick, um, we will wrap it up here in just a couple minutes. I did write down one question I want to throw out to you. All right. Uh, you know, we shared just, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. You know, we just covered five uh, uh, alleged accounts here in this hour's time here. You know, like I said, that's a minuscule amount of t uh, examples. In numerous, uncountable innumerable accounts out there. Now, the question I wrote down, I said, are some abductees sought out on purpose? And by, uh, do you think that some abductees are targeted? And if so, I believe and if so, so why? Absolutely. Okay, why? 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 Well, I think, you know, like if, uh, like the generational thing, they're going to target generations that are, that they're still, you know, like, uh, UFO abduction, or I mean, alien abductions can can go on for generations. Like going back, uh, say, four generations, great, 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 great grandfather was abducted, mm -hmm. as an example. You know, and then it gets to where um, his child is abducted. The next child, his child is abducted. Sure. You know, like okay. like keeping track of or having some kind of a agenda or a program that sticks with one particular family over generations. And, you know, who knows why it could be, uh, uh, bringing that, uh, that entire family into a, you know, uh, genetic changes they're making or Mike, whatever. I don't, I, I, that's, I'm pointing up in the sky. <laughs> like I'm seeing a UFO. Yeah. I was like, wow, what, 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 what are you seeing? <laughs> but I'm just pointing at my Bud Hopkins book, you know, the intruders. I, I want to cover that as a topic. Some, sometimes, yeah, you know, we do, we do need that's, to. that involves over years and years of family that is encountering UFOs and alien many, abductions. Many, many decades. Yeah. And another example that we were, we could have shared today, but we ran out of time. Um, the alien abductions of, um, Audrey and Debbie Hewins from their childhood bedroom they both claim to start being abducted from their bedroom when their kids like five six seven years old and it went on up until they were in their 30s that they well, continued yeah. they claimed to continue to be abducted um, yeah i believe it you know and, and this thing that i was uh talking about this generational thing i've talked about this movie before on on air not a lot of detail but um, it's a mini series. It was on in the nineties on made for TV. Steven Spielberg did it called taken. Yeah. It's not the Liam Neeson. No, taken, it, it is not. No. <laughs> um, which really blew me away when they come out with a movie called taken when it was already a movie. <laughs> it was the taken. 90s. The title was taken. The title it was. was taken, but, um, uh, got a, a very young Dakota Fanning in there. That is uh, absolutely amazing. Great actors. Great show. If you haven't seen it, I have the the complete CD collection of it, but it is just fabulous, and that really goes into generational yeah. abduction. And that was from the what was it, the early mid nineties? Is that when that series came out, or is it? Yeah, kind of closer, you know, closer two thousand. Yeah. Okay. No, no, it was midish nineties, maybe more. Okay. Mid mid to late. Eh, I don't know. Yeah, I've heard lots of good things about that. I, I haven't seen it. I need to watch it. I really do. Yeah. Mike, this has been good, man. Thank you for making this work. Um, well, thank you. It is Friday, April 7th. We hope everyone has a wonderful Easter weekend. Um, if you celebrate or not, we hope you have a great weekend, regardless of anything. Yeah. You know? um, just be kind. You know, just care. I'm and be kind. Ham. You're, oh, okay. Sounds good. 
<laughs> ham, sweet potato. You know, I thought you said you were going to be ham. Man, that's, all, that's why I said, ham. oh, that's because I said be kind, and you said I'm going to be oh, ham. <laughs> I'm going to eat ham on, on, on See, Easter. I thought ham makes you swell up. Oh, I don't care. Oh, my gosh. I, I suffer and swell because of my love for ham. So we're going, I'm a ham freak. We're going, to, we're going full circle, circle here. Yep. Mike's going to eat ham, and his skin's going to yep. start splitting again because he's just he's like that kid in, in Willy Wonka in the chocolate factory. Yeah. I even have a uh, an apron that I wear for grilling. It, it is a nice black apron that has a white outline of a pig on it. <laughs> and underneath it, in big white letters, it says, I like big butts. <laughs> oh, so, <man>. you know... <laughs> Yes, I love a ham. I love a good ham. Well, Mike, uh, and you are a ham, sir. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, thanks again for joining me. Uh, another great episode. This has been a blast. Thank to, thanks to all of you for tuning in. Again, check out the Patreon page if you want to support the podcast. No better way to do that. You can subscribe, hello, subscribe as um, for as little as a buck a month. We'd love to see you guys yep. there. Mike, until it's next worth time. It. Until next time, buddy, what do our fellow zoners need to do? Peace out. Thank <laughs> you.